Okay, so I've got a few more book recommendations for you. I really enjoyed doing the first of these videos, and although it wasn't the most watched video I'd made, I really got a kick out of the feedback, especially the comments that I got. Quite a number of comments saying on the back of you discussing one of these books, I put an order in for, for it. And, and if you are one of those people, I'd be interested to know actually what you thought of the book after you've read it. Three more books for you, three really, really good books, three very different books. And remember, this isn't a book review, really. This is a book recommendation. It's my personal recommendations. The first one is gonna be Richard Dawkins, The Ancestor's Tale. The second one is going to be Peter White, Not Even Wrong. And the third is going to be Nick Bostrom, uh, Super Intelligence. Okay, so without further ado, let's move on to the first book, Richard Dawkins, The Ancestor's Tale. This was 2004 this book was released. Now, the reason I didn't, I wanted to talk about this book last time. I didn't because I knew they were doing a reissue of it in which they've updated some of the information. That doesn't make the older version of it uh, defunct it's still a fantastic book okay but there is a newer version it may only be released in the UK I couldn't see on amazon.com I couldn't see any mention of the newer version it's a newer hardback version the, this is a book where the hardback version is very much worth getting over the paperback because as far as I'm aware the paperbacks I could be wrong on this but I don't think the paperbacks have all the illustrations and the diagrams in them and this is a book that really benefits from this now look I've read quite a number of Richard Dawkins books this isn't just my favorite Richard Dawkins book which it is but it's probably my favorite book of all time and that's probably quite a recommendation from anybody to for them to tell you it's their favorite book of all time it's a very special book I love that I just think it's brilliant the way that this book is designed. There are two problems with books along this line that take a journey through evolutionary history is that they tend to start back in the dim and distant past and work towards us. They'll start at sort of archaea and bacteria and work towards humans. And there's two problems with that. The first is that it seems very goal oriented, like, like evolution has a purpose, it has an end goal. And it doesn't, of course, that's not the way it works. And the second is it makes us seem very special, and we're not. We are not a special endpoint. We're no more special as a, we may have special unique characteristics, of course, but we're no more special as an evolutionary present endpoint than any other extant species. So this gets, it gets round, uh, Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong, who, who co-wrote it with him, get round this by going backwards right and it starts it's our journey going backwards and so we're going backwards through time and we're meeting it's based on the canterbury tales and we're having these meetings these rendezvous with other travelers along the way and these other travelers are, are other species and they're traveling back through time so we have these rendezvous points with what he calls our common ancestors or as he calls them concestors in this book and so that is how the book functions and so at each point you get a little bit told about this rendezvous point and the groups that you're the clades that you're rendezvousing with and then you'll get some tales along with it so i just put a couple of markers just to give you an idea of what it's about so for example this is the rendezvous this is the page for the rendezvous with new world monkeys and you get some information on that and also you get to see the groups and then you'll get um a bit of a a bit of a description and then you get a tail right and one of the marvelous things about this is this is the howler monkey's tail and one of the great things about this book is that you never you never really know what you're going to get next it's one of these books where if you sit down for an hour a couple of hours to read it you'd never know what you're going to be reading about because the nature of these tales is that it's it's not it's not sober formal stuff that necessarily follows in with what you think um so for example the howler monkey's tale is about trichromacy and how as mammals nocturnal uh, from our nocturnal mam mammalian origins we lost trichromacy uh, because it meant we could see in the dark better and then some mammals including ourselves including a lot of the old world monkeys have regained trichromacy and that is the uh, 
Howler Monkey's Tale, it's about how through first a gene duplication event and then through point mutations on one of those uh, two versions of that same gene there that we have gained trichromacy. And this is why, by the way, you need the graphics because it means that in you need these little graphics to illustrate these different things. And you really never know what you're going to get next. For example, uh, I've got another little link here on the grasshopper's tail. What would the grasshopper's tail be about? Well, I won't tell you what the grasshopper's tail is about, but what I will tell you is you end up with a photo there. I don't know if you can see it of Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, George W. Bush with the, with the uh, statement next to it, wouldn't a Martian split them three against one? Because apparently three of them are very light skinned and one of them is dark skinned. So the grasshopper's tale turns into a tale about the way that we view race and ethnicity. So it's, it's, it kind of reminds me, and, I, and I'm, I don't want to flatter myself when I say this is my favourite book and say this is something that I do myself, but it kind of reminds me of something that I like to do in my videos, which is that I'm quite prepared to go on a bit of an aside if I think it's going to be an interesting one. If I think there's an interesting tale to be told, it doesn't have to be intrinsic in what I'm talking about. And that is the beauty, that's the brilliance of this book for me, which is that I never knew what I was going to be reading about next. But what I did know is that by the end of that book, after I'd got back to the um, archaea and the bacteria, and I got right through to the end of the book, I'd learned so many different things and such a diverse amount of things and some delightful things that I'd learned there. So that is just a mega, mega, mega recommendation. If you haven't read The Ancestor's Tale, it's a big book. There's a lot to read, but it, it kind of flew by. I, for a book that size, that's about 600 pages, it, it really, really went, it went all too quick uh, there. So that's a really, really good recommendation. So the second book that I want to talk about is Peter White's uh, Not Even Wrong. The Failure of String Theory and the Continuing Challenge to Unify the Laws of Physics. And this was one of these books that when I when I decided what to order this book and, and read it, I wasn't really sure what I was going to get out of it really, but it just sounded kind of interesting. And this guy is not some kind of crackpot. Often some of these books that are criticising what is quite a mainstream scientific field are kind of peripheral crackpot figures. Peter White is not a peripheral crackpot figure. In fact, you can see the recommendations on the back are from Roger Penrose and Lee Small in there. So this isn't some total crackpot guy. Uh, this is a proper, uh, well, he's a, he's a mathematical physicist. And what I will do first, let me just play you a clip from an interview that he gave uh, on the big think YouTube channel where he's discussing why he called his book not even wrong. Uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of a famous phrase among physicists. It goes back to a, uh, there's a, a well-known theorist called Wolfgang Pauli in the, in the 50s. The story is that towards the end of his life someone, I guess he, I guess he, he was well-known for being uh, very kind of hypercritical of, 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 of things that were going on and would, would get up in the middle of a seminar and start saying, you know, it's wrong, it's completely wrong. And, and late in his life, someone asked him about some work, uh, some, some, some speculative idea of someone, and he evidently shook his head and said, well, that one's not even wrong. And, and so the, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a well-known phrase among physicists. And it, it kind of carries, I think, two, two meanings. I mean, w one, one of them is just kind of a, more somewhat of a term of abuse. Well, that's so bad, it's not even wrong. But, but there's a, a more interesting, and there's also a more kind of technical meaning that a very often you you, you have a spe, you have a speculative idea, and if you if it's if it's not a very good idea or it, 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 it turns out you actually can't you you end up not being able to do very much with it you end up not being able to um, to predict anything with it or to, to or it, it's just not useful so there's also a notion of not being not even wrong in the sense that it's not an idea which can be fully developed or can turn into something which is powerful enough to actually predict something and be wrong. So this, it's, it's a, one problem with string theory is that it, it's kind of a, a, a theory which it can explain what the problems are, but the problems are such that you can't ever even pin it down and say, this is exactly what it predicts and let's go out and test it. So it's not even capable of being, of wrong, of being wrong or being falsified or being shown to be wrong. So that's the, the more relevant meaning here, really. 
So what I found really fascinating about this book and what really uh, makes me want to makes me want to tell you about it and to recommend it is not because particularly because of its focus it's bent on string theory although you might find that interesting in the way you discuss discusses how string theory has taken over physics departments to the exclusion of everything else which is kind of what his problem is he doesn't say this is definitely a dead end but he says that perhaps for something that hasn't really made any falsifiable predictions in decade after decade perhaps we ought to be sort of investing a little bit more of our time in looking at other things as well and um, other potential solutions uh, but it's not that it's some of the things that surround it that are much more general cases and things recently have, have reminded me of some of this including some of the the interactions i've had with christy winters and her talk of peer review because there's quite a little bit in here about the way that peer review has broken down with regard to string theory and a lot of that is because it is so fucking complicated in fact one of the things which was quite comforting to me is that you know, we all end up in these little scenarios and we think, well, I hope it's not just me. But I, I've read journal articles on many things that, that quickly become so complicated that I think, well, I've just got to take this on good faith because there's no way that I can possibly, unless I'm going to invest a huge portion of my time, possibly invest the time required to, to, to deconstruct this and to try and understand exactly what's going on here. And what this guy says, this guy is a very learned mathematical physicist. He says that he, when he reads papers, even in very closely allied fields to his own, it's still just fucking gibberish to him. That a lot of these subjects have become so fucking technical that even when you are an established scientist in these fields, you're reading, leafing through them and just taking a lot of it on, on good faith because, because it is so technical, so complicated. And it isn't just enough to be an expert in that field. You need to be an expert in that field, but in that tiny little sliver of that field that that other person is involved in. And what that has led to is a certain amount of slippage. And he talks about tens and tens and tens of thousands of papers on string theory that have been published, seemingly most of them not going anywhere whatsoever. Uh, and perhaps with very lax standards in many cases of peer review. And he suspects because many of them are so complicated and so difficult to dissect that it's actually very difficult to peer review them and to pick, pick out the wheat from the chaff. So there's a great deal about that. It talks about the history of how string theories have developed and of course how they moved on to brain theories and all these kinds of things. So there's a lot of information in there. But it's often not the technical information that's the most interesting in that book. It's how it, how it manifests within the field of science itself. And by the time you've read that book, right, if you've got a kind of Popperian idea of science as just that which is falsifiable, etc., etc., and that which can be repeated, what you're going to do by the end of that book is that you're going to question whole tracts of science that we're quite happy to discuss nowadays and say, well, would that class as science and would that class as science? And what you realize is, is that whole ethos of looking at science is really, it's only one lens in which you can look at science. And that it's actually quite a complicated thing to even think about what is science in the first place and to what standards are we going to look at? So that's Peter White's Not Even Wrong. Very interesting book. The last one is a book that I read uh, quite recently after having made some videos on artificial intelligence and giving my thoughts and that is Nick Bostrom's super intelligence of course you probably have heard of Nick Bostrom from his simulation argument which is the idea that because the number of simulated universes would exceed the number of unsimulated universes uh, under certain conditions that the chances are more likely that we live in a simulated universe than a real universe which of course opened up the question that I asked in one of my videos is that well what would actually constitute a simulated universe anyway um, especially with regards to a deity perhaps creating a universe and we could be the deity if we created a universe what would be the the actual manifest tangible difference between a real and simulated universe but Nick Bostrom's book is a little bit different to that, even though that kind of spins off from that. He's talking about superintelligence, which is artificial intelligence, yes, but he covers more things than that. He also talks about other forms of artificial intelligence. 
such as the ways in which we could reinforce our own intelligence through genetic manipulation perhaps he talks about the ways in which that we could interface with our brains uh, we, we, so, so to sort of uh, magnify the, the cognitive abilities of our brains through artificial uh, cyber genetic transhuman means um, and there's lots of interesting things that he says about that and I don't want to spoil a lot of what is in that book because it's actually worth listening to him say it rather than listening to me say it what I will say about this book is that it covered a lot more ground than I expected um, because I expected it to be about artificial intelligence which it is but it's about so much more besides and the other thing that I found really really fascinating about this book that makes me recommend it is that it made me realize just how and I, and I freely admit it how naive I was in my understanding of what a super intelligent artificial intelligence would be like because whenever I think of a super intelligent artificial intelligence I can't get out of the box or at least I couldn't get out of the box of just imagining a kind of very very intelligent computer and by that what I mean is still having the restrictions that I would expect of a computer in other words it might process very fast and be able to do things that I can't do but it would still be very flat in its thinking it would still be be constricted in ways that would allow me to outthink it and once you get away from that kind of paradigm of thinking of a super intelligent artificial intelligence of just a very very intelligent computer and imagining it having all the Machiavellian characteristics potentially that you have and the motivations that you have and trying the little things that you maybe would try anything that you can do anything that you can conceive of any little eventuality or little trick that you might want to pull any little shitty stunt that you might want to be able to pull the super intelligent artificial intelligence can pull as well but it's going to be so much fucking better at it than you are it is going to be second guessing you at every touch and turn along the way and of course then we have this kind of exponential effect where the computer once it develops perhaps past some threshold level is then capable of developing its super intelligence or spawning something else that's even more super intelligent that effectively it's pulling itself further up the chain there by its own bootstraps until it develops what Nick Bostrom terms a decisive strategic advantage that is when it gets to the point where it has the cognitive abilities and the abilities elsewhere uh, to be able to dominate and what he spends a lot of this book talking about is making sure that if this happens that we do it that we create a super intelligence that is benign and benevolent towards us because as he points out we may only get one chance at this and if we fuck it up there are many more ways of getting it wrong than there are of getting it right so what he spends a lot of time in this book is talking about what could go wrong the different ways in which you could go wrong and then he talks about the ways in which we may try and constrain a super intelligence and the ways in which trying to constrain it may not work and then finally he tries to give you give us a path uh, that might work okay so it's a really really good fundamental book and it just I was amazed at how far down the chain he got and how many things that he'd come up with that I'd never fucking considered even though I thought I'd given it uh, a fair amount of thought there so it's really really interesting now what I will say that I didn't enjoy about this book there are some parts of the book where for me I'm I wasn't really interested in quite such a technical understanding of it and it does get a little bit bogged down a couple of times and there was a couple of times where I thought you know I'm gonna have to keep rereading these last few pages to, to fully understand this and do I need to fully understand this to kind of get the messages of the book and the understanding of the concepts of the book no I don't so it's one of those books where you may on a couple of occasions think I'm gonna cut my losses here and just plow on with a book I advise you if I say you feel to do it because it is a really really good book it will challenge I guarantee you unless you're Nick Bostrom or unless you've already read the book it will challenge how you view the idea of a super intelligence 
and it will perhaps debox you from the constraints that you presently have with regards to artificial intelligences uh, and, and what an artificial intelligence would be capable of and the dangers that it would present. So that's three books for you. That's three books for you there. We have uh, The Ancestor's Tale. Richard Dawkins' The Ancestor's Tale, which, as I said to you, I think is the finest book that I've ever read. And it's just a great read to dip into because you never know what you're going to get next. I guarantee you will find some delightful parts in that book unexpected parts we have peter white's not even wrong which partly gives you a deconstruction of string theory and when it stands and how it dominates physics departments and questions the validity of that but also tells you a lot about the state of physics and science and how even people in peter white's position who are fantastic mathematicians can't understand all of this shit on this your little fraction and the ramifications that that has and then we have Nick Bostrom with his book Super Intelligence which I'm making you a little Noel Plum guarantee which is that it will pull you out of your little box of thinking about artificial intelligences and of the scale of things that could define a super intelligence and the dangers that that involves three very different books three very very interesting books those are my three recommendations thanks for watching bye for now